Hi everybody, thanks for joining. Uh, welcome, to, uh, welcome to the Event Master intro. Uh, my name is Vincent Aiella, I'm a, la a lead sales support engineer for Barco Inc. Um, and again, I'm here just to talk to you about our image processing line. What does it do, how does it work? Um, you know, what is the, what's the big hubbub about? So, uh, with the aid of a PowerPoint that we're gonna talk to, or talk about, or talk to uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to walk you through, um, you know, the, the different processors, the different uh, configurations that we offer, as well as um, some terminology that we use inside of Event Master, in, inside of the Event Master world. Uh, once we complete that, we are going to walk through a basic setup. Uh, the basic setup will actually happen right before we go to break. So we'll do that until about 9.50, we'll go to break, we'll come back and then we'll start talking about programming, like how to get pips on screen or windows on screen or layers on screen, whatever you refer to it as, and um, you know, how to make a cohesive look or an image composition come out of, a, of, out of an output, right? So again, this is the, this is the very basics. Uh, so without further ado, I'm just gonna get started on the PowerPoint. So we call this one image processing in a few pictures. Um, so what do we do? How does it work? What is it? What is it, right? What is image processing? Well, it, it's the ability to take multiple multi-format sources, mix, layer, compose them, uh, utilizing our image processing them, image processing, and then send them out to one or many displays. Sometimes they're in an array of displays, like an LCD or an L, uh, LCD panel display, LED array, uh, just standard monitors, some of our world famous projection, right? Uh, or, you know, even sending out to a record feed, sat truck feed, uh, pretty much, you know, anything that can accept a video signal, right? That's what we would consider a uh, destination or a display, okay? Now, it's up to the user to decide how all of that gets processed, how all of it, how the throughput of it, and, um, and you know, how it's displayed. So, what we're going to do real quick is we're going to uh, talk about a, a few of our products, and, and whatnot. So he, right here we have the uh, Image Pro line. The Image Pro line uh, assists us with our scaling, so uh, scaling and in, in, uh, conversion. So we have the Image Pro 2 and the Image Pro 2 Dual, which assist us in up-down cross-conversion of dig both digital and analog, while the Image Pro 4K is primarily for digital. Okay, so uh, we do up, down, and cross within the digital realm on the Image Pro 4K for the, you know formats like DP 1.2, HDMI 2.0, and 12G SDI. Uh, not so much on the Image Pro 2 or the Image Pro 2 Dual. Those are primarily uh, 3G and, and dual link resolutions. So we talk about conversion. What is conversion? Conversion is you know uh, uh, one signal format to another or one connector to another. Uh, with with you know reclocking so um, when we do that color when we do that c conversion what we do is we actually convert everything to uh, RGB or SMPTE color spaces also known as RGB or YCB CR uh, internally and then we give the uh, the user the option to to use one of those color conversions uh, on the output as well we do up or down scaling or up down and cross conversion. Uh, so we can take, you know, PAL NTSC to 4K or UHD or kind of any iteration, or we can go from 4K down to NTSC. So we, we do uh, up or down scaling. We do it quite well, actually. So let's take a look at the EventMaster family. Uh, we have the Image Pro line. We have the EX. We have the S3. We have the E2. Now, before I get too far into the E2, I think the biggest thing we want to specify is that they're all pretty much the same thought process. They're all pretty much the same build process and um, dynamics, right? The, the, the software is the same, the cards are the same, everything is the same, except we have increased or decreased capacity depending on which box you need. And what that means is that's not necessarily a bad thing. That could mean that, uh, you know, if you don't want to buy into the biggest E2, well, you can have the same functionality in one of our less expensive units like the S3. So real quick, before, so now that we're into that, let's talk about the E2. So what does the E2 do? Well, it does uh, single screen and or widescreen image compositions as well as auxiliary outputs. What does all that mean? Well, uh, as we can see by this slide, you know, on the bottom, we have a single screen co image composition where we've taken 
uh, one source and overlapped it onto another uh, to create this, this compos compositional look. We also do widescreen image compositions so we can create wider than normal aspect ratio, uh, wider than regular aspect ratio screens. Like the, the one up top there is, a, is probably a dual wide HD or dual wide 4K with a couple of uh, pips or layers layered over the top of it, right? So to create that composition. Here's an example of all of those, of all of those, uh, those things in play, right? We have uh, a screen image composition right there in the center, which is multiple projectors. Um, kind of blended together or data doubled or feathered or however you want to refer to it together to create one large image composition or one large cohesive image. And then we have scaling and conversion happening uh, throughout the delay screens, throughout the side screens, throughout, you know, throughout the building. Um, some that we see here, some that we don't, right? I'm sure that's also going out to a record feed and, and a sat truck or whatnot. So the E2, uh, we're not going to beat you up with the specifics on it. Here's a, a little data sheet that you can refer to this video later uh, if, you, if you need to. Uh, the E2 can essentially take in 40 HD uh, signals and output 40 HD signals. Or, sorry, uh, take in 40 HD and output 18 HD. Uh, it can also do 4K, right? So when we talk about 4K, 4K is essentially... Or, or UHD slash 4K is essentially two, a two by two matrix of HDs, right? So it's two wide by two tall HD or 2K uh, to create an overall resolution of 3840 by 2160 or 4096 by 2160, also known as 4K. So when we talk about 4K in the E2, uh, the E2 can do up to 16 4K in and up to 8 4K out in various uh, various ut utilizations, right? So it can be a couple of, maybe a couple of 4K uh, outputs for screen destinations, maybe it could be a couple of 4K outputs for auxiliaries. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the S3, uh, again, is essentially the same box, just less capacity, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Um, can, can actually, uh, uh, or here's a data sheet on that, right? So refer to this later if you like. The S3, 4K, when we talk, or sorry, yeah, the S3 4K, when we talk about that, it can take up to 5 4K in and output up to 6 4K out. Um, so, you know, we'll get to talking about that later. Now, the great thing about the E2, the S3, the EX, the Image Pro, uh, Image Pro 4K uh, line, we'll talk about later. Um, actually, there's, there's a slight, slight rule to what I'm about to say or a slight caveat to what I'm about to say. It can accept all of the uh, Gen 1, Gen 2 cards, the Image Pro 4K can actually only accept Gen 2 cards, which again we'll talk about later. But the E2, S3, EX can all accept Gen 1 and Gen 2, both in the E2 Gen 1 and the E2 Gen 2. So keep that in mind. E2 Gen 2 can accept Gen 1 cards. Don't be afraid to put a Gen 1 card in your E2 Gen 2. So E2 Gen 1 cards like DisplayPort 1.1 HD and, and the HDMI 1.4 uh, duo combo card, the DBID card, the 3G SDI card, or you step into the Gen 2 cards like the Tricombo in, uh, which has DP 1.2, HDMI 2.0, and 12G SDI, multiple 12G SDI actually. Or you can go with the Quad DP 1.2, Quad HDMI 2.0, or even the CXPIO card. Cool thing about the CXPIO card inside of the E2 and S3 is it conforms to whatever slot you place it in. If it goes into a uh, if it goes into an output, then uh, you'll see it on the output. If it goes into an input slot, then it, you'll see it as, as an input. Um, we're, we're not going to really cover too much about that card in specific later, but uh, you know it's out there. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us. On the output, we have pretty much all the same cards we have as the input, except um, we added a Gen 2 Fiber, um, a Gen, Gen 2 Fiber SFP Plus card. So the fiber output card uh, is essentially a, a BYOT or a bring your own transceiver card. Uh, it allows us, it's kind of like a Gen, uh, Gen 1.5 it, or a low, low Gen 2. It, it essentially has um, the capacity of a Gen 1 card, but it's in our, in our new Gen 2 format. And, it, and it, uh, we, we consider it a Gen 2 card, to be honest with you. Uh, it does one 4K output with a split plus a split, or it will do two discrete 3Gs. Now, the great thing about this card is it uses, um, like, it's, like it says, bring your own transceivers, right? Well, we happen to use uh, Embryonics 
um, 21G transceivers in, uh, in L with the LC, connect uh, LC connectors. That's what you see here, right? So uh, we can send, you know, um, you, you can drop in, you the user, you the end user can drop in any of those uh, transceivers and, and as long as it's, it can receive on the other end, it, it, you know, it, it should just work, it work, should work just fine. Great thing about the fiber output card as well is that it is a, uh, it runs off of SMPTE standards for the fiber optic. So uh, you could potentially use our fiber input card for our Barco UDX or UDM projectors or it could send it to a different piece of equipment, maybe a, manu a different manufacturer, as long as they can accept the SMPTE standards anywhere from ST259 to ST2082, uh, it should work just fine, right? And we've, we've proven it both at a, in, in, in real life and in, at Infocom, you know, and we ran an awesome setup using it. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to us. So when we talk about, you know, when people talk about Eventmaster or E2, they talk about Gen 1 versus Gen 2, and everybody says, ah, oh, really need the latest and greatest, which we're very happy to hear. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that the, there's not much difference between the Gen 1 and Gen 2 chassis, per se. Uh, they, the Gen 2 does have an upgraded power supply, so if it's fully loaded with E2 Gen 2 cards, um, there's no power issues or anything like that. Uh, but the other major difference is the Gen 1 has, uh, basically has the ability to take in up to 12 4K inputs, uh, while the Gen 2, the E2 Gen 2, has the ability to take up to 16 4K inputs. And really those are kind of the only differences. Again, you can reference these two slides, go back, pause it, reference these two slides later on if you really want to talk about the difference in capacity on those two units. Okay, so we talked about the two types of out, very lightly talked about the two types of outputs earlier. We have uh, image compositions, also known as screen destinations, and we have conversions slash scalers, also known as auxes. Uh, those are two very different type of, of outputs, and we'll refer to those by their proper names later on, right? We'll, we'll call them screen destinations or auxes um, as we progress through the setup today. So what's a screen destination? A screen destination is one or, one or many physical outputs that feed the same screen or the same array of screens or the same array of monitors or, or what have you. Uh, it can be a single screen, widescreen, or multi-screen destination. Uh, this screen destination utilizes scaling layers, also known as PIPs or windows, uh, to create a composition along with backgrounds, right? So you can, you, you can transition those backgrounds and layers seamlessly. So here we have an example of uh, destination one is a three projector blend uh, with multiple pips into it. Destination two is uh, oh. destination two is a um, uh, single screen output. Destination three also a single screen, just not a projector. It's a LCD panel. So. Uh, as far as that image composition goes or that screen destination, it can support backgrounds, whether they can be a live, a matte, or a still store background, uh, native, right? So you could do a native background with a still store. You could do a native background with an input, as well as a window that floats over the top of it, right? Which we would call a pip or a layer. I like to call them layers because that's what we call them in Event Master Toolset. Uh, so, you know, there are many, you know, there, there are a couple different types of layers that we support. We support a mix layer. So if you take a look at the mix layer, it is essentially a window, windows with mixing transitions, right? It dissolves from one to the other. So you could see that, uh, you could see that source dissolving from one to the other nice and clean. Or we have a single layer, which allows you to do one of two things, either a broadcast quality cut or a dip to black or a dip to white while it changes the source and comes back in. So you can use these single layers and mixed layers in your image composition. Uh, for example, an E2 or an E2 Gen 2 can do up to two 4K out, uh, wide, you know, super wide screen, or I don't want to say super wide, but a, a wide screen destination um, that maybe is uh, two 4K wide by one 4K tall. You can have up to eight HD mixing windows on there, so we could see the, the mixing windows mix from one to another, right? Uh, and they go into that mixing mode. Or you can even do, uh, or you can split it up and do 16 HD non-mixing windows. So a mixed layer uses two HD non-mixing layers or windows. So if you don't use them in mixed layer mode, you have twice as many, twice as many, right? 
So we're doing a 2x4K. We can have up to 16 HD non-mixing windows. Uh, now, capacity differs for different input resolutions that you'll need to scale into those windows. Um, and we'll talk about, if you, know, if you want to talk about that, um, I urge you to come visit us at one of our classes. Uh, take one of our certification classes where we can actually dive way deeper into this. There's so much more that we're um, kind of, you know, uh, not including in this conversation because this is really just the basics, you know. So come see us at one of our uh, one of our Barco authorized training centers. Um, we're going to show you a, a link a little bit later on how to get to those. Okay, so uh, image composition, you know, we, again, we have those two types of outputs, image composition, a screen destination. Uh, or uh, scalars and auxes for the S3. Now the S3 again is reduced capacity or can be utilized in a reduced capacity fashion. So if we do one 4K out, we can have up to four HD mixing layers, or if we do two 4K out, we can have up to two HD mixing layers, as well as the auxes that you've come to know and expect from an E2, right? So again, it's just less capacity, so less layers or less canvas space or, or both, right, um, for the S3. So here's some examples of the ways you can split that up. Maybe you don't want to do, uh, you don't want to do one 4K. Maybe you want to break it down into HDs. Well, you can do up to eight HD outs with, a, you know, one layer, one one single layer per destination, right? And then, uh, or you can do, you know, up to two HD mixing windows split across four HD outs. Um, and then we can also do those auxes, or you know, one 4K or four HD so on and so forth. So what is an aux? You know, we kind of already mentioned it, but we haven't really talked about what it, what it does or what it is. It's a single screen output that cannot be assigned any layers or pips, and any source in the system can be sent to an aux destination for up, down, and cross conversion, right? Everything will be scaled uh, to the resolution defined in the aux configuration, and we'll show, I'll show you how to do that a little bit later on. Now, one of the uh, one of the things about the auxes is it's a cut only transition, so it's a single frame broadcast quality cut uh, between sources. So, one of the examples, or a couple of the examples for an auxiliary destination, is a downstage monitor, a record feed, a sat truck feed, a uh, green room feed, a stage manager position, maybe a rack room monitoring. Uh, area where you want to see the, the either the full screen or a portion of the screen, you know, in, in, a, in real time. Uh, now, one of the kind of duh moments we have here is that screens and aux destinations can be in the same system configuration. So you can have both. You can have screen destinations with your screen image, with your image composition, and you can have auxiliary outputs in the same system and control them all at the same time. In fact, I'll show you how to do that a little bit later on. We have the third output type that we don't really consider an output type, but some people do, so we'll call it the third output type, and that's the multi-viewer. And a multi-viewer a, a multi -viewer is an output that allows the operator to see uh, all of their inputs and destinations on one or many displays. In fact, when we talk about one or many displays, uh, depending on the card that you utilize for your multi-view, like if, say, if you use a Gen 1 HDMI card, you have two HD outputs, two discrete HD multi-viewers. Or if you use a Gen 2 multi-viewer card, you have up to four discrete HD multi-viewers with uh, uh, four discrete multi four discrete multi-viewers or one 4K multi-viewer with a split, and the split meaning like a copy of it. So you can have the same content; they're not discrete, but you can have up to four of those 4K outputs active. Again, not discrete 4K, but copies of the first, essentially. So uh, the great thing about the multi-view is it's user configurable. Um, so the user will go in and actually build their multi-view, and I'll show you how to do that later. I'll give you a live example of how to build a multi-viewer. So let's talk about uh, linking. Well, we're going to quickly cover linking, so you know we can we can we can show you how uh, how well the family of processors work together. So we have the E2S3 EX. Uh, E2 can link using its expansion ports. S3 has the same. If you do link it, and I'm not going to beat you up on the numbers here, uh, if you do link them together, they, um, they, you essentially increase the capacity, right? You inc increase your input capacity, you increase your output capacity, um, and it would be linked through this little schematic right here. Uh, and, and here's some more you know, ways to digest that information, right? More inputs, more destinations, more outputs, okay? 
Uh, same with S3s. So we can have up to like 10 4K in or four 4K out with aux scalers, right? Or uh, two, uh, two by four image compositions with more layers, more, you know, more, 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 right? So some more slides about that image processing. You know, we can even link processors to other processors. And like in this example, we have an E2 linked to two S3s for increased capacity. Uh, we do the EX, right? Then EX is one of the newer products to the, to the family. Uh, the EX stands for extension ex or expansion. Uh, so in, in as far as ex uh, expansion goes, you can link it to an E2 or an S3 uh, for increased inputs, increased outputs, or increased canvas space or layers, right? Uh, the other side to that is extension. You can actually extend uh, over great distance utilizing our, uh, utilizing our CXP over fiber, which we may talk about a little bit later. So again, um, we have the EX, which can also work as a standalone. So it can take in up to six HD inputs and, and output six HD, um, output six HDs, right? It gen locks everything. It's great for you resizing to match LED walls. It's a fantastic signal format converter with, uh, with a TCI, TCO, also known as tricombo in, tricombo out cards. It could be a fantastic digital univer uh, universal digital 4K 60 converter, right? Uh, we also, again, we use it as expansion. Now, the great thing about the EX is we did a video with um, Chuck Lazica of Nationwide Video, uh, of, of Nationwide, uh, explaining the EX and all of its ins and outs and how to use the fiber optic. It's also available on this YouTube page. Uh, the Barco Fulsome IP YouTube page. So when you're done with this, go check that out. I urge you to watch the full 13 minute video. It explains the ins and outs of the EX and it's fantastic, right? Okay, so the EX can use Gen 1 and Gen 2 cards for everything except for the CXPIO uh, cards, primarily because it's already built in, so it's not needed, right? So uh, if you use it as a standalone scaler, you could do stuff like one 4K in, multiple, four, multiple HD out, or vice versa. You can uh, do a, a signal format conversion, right? So if we want to go from SDI to HDMI or DisplayPort, we can do that as well. Uh, you can link them together and have more powerful, uh, more, more capacity, right? So we can, you know, if you link them together, you can do an eight by eight HD matrix switcher scaler converter. Uh, you can even, like I said, extend or expand existing products like the S3 or the E2. Um, now, this is one of those powerful photos that we like to show off where you can link up to eight EXs to an E2. Then we have the Image Pro 4K. Uh, so the Image Pro 4K runs in three standard modes, standard program, standard preview matrix. It's, it's more of a, a up-down cross, con up cross converter for digital. You cannot use generation one cards, only generation two cards are supported in it. Uh, so I also did an awesome video with Tim Moore informally of Rentex, uh, on, and that's available on the YouTube uh, page as well. I urge you to go watch that, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on the Image Pro 4K. So let's talk about some, some uh, terminology for um, for uh, Event Master. So we do EDID on the inputs, we do custom format outputs, uh, so, and we can also read on our outputs, we could reach out and observe EDIDs on those and conform to them, conform, make, maybe make a custom output for that or, or a custom, uh, custom format for that output. We do support HDCP, we don't strip anything. Um, all, if, if, you do re if your devices require HDCP, all devices in the signal chain must be compliant in order for a picture show to show. We don't strip, we don't bypass, hygiene, could wink, or do any kind of thing like that to, to HDCP, we're fully compliant. Uh, internally, we utilize a thing called the cross point, uh, the, our cross point matrix, or, which is an internal matrix router. It allows any input to be routed to any output. Uh, all inputs are available at any time and all signals pass through this point. Before they hit that cross point matrix, they get, they get converted to a, uh, a system native rate. There's a scan rate converter on every, on every input basically that, that conforms it to that cross point matrix um, specification. So by default, it's set to 5994. So we have an example where we have inputs that are 5994, 50, and 60. They all get converted on the input card before they hit the cross point. This allows for that single frame broadcast quality cut. So we have, we support Genlock. Genlock system reference, right? So black burst and tri-level on the E2 S3. Uh, if you terminate at the E2 or S3, it must be 75 ohm terminated. Uh, if you need to hook up and 
generate a uh, um, Genlock signal in a pinch, you can use an EX or Image Pro 4K. They also uh, generate Genlock. Uh, connector capacity. So individual inputs and output connectors have a selectable capacity. This is the way we tell the box how to whether it's a single link or 4K or dual link resolution. Um, I'm not going to beat you up too much on this, other than uh, if you're using a old, uh, if you're using um, Gen 1 cards, you may have to uh, kind of reassign capacity based upon which card you've used or, or which spigot you're using and what resolution you want to bring in on those inputs. Uh, so one of the major notes from one of the major takeaways from this slide is initial release generation one IO cards have a maximum capacity of four links per card, also known as four HD inputs, one link being one HD input. So if you want to do a dual link input, you might have to rob connector capacity from one to dedicate it towards another. If you want to do a 4K, you might have to rob connector capacity from three of them and add it to another. Uh, the rules are a little bit looser on uh, the Generation 2 cards because the Generation 2 cards have eight links worth of capacity. By default, they have all six active, all six spigots active on a tri-combo. Um, so you can, you can actually add capacity to those as you see fit. So let's talk about Event Master control surfaces real fast. We have the EC30, EC50, and EC210. The EC200 uh, is now uh, kind of our end of life. The EC200 was the predecessor to the 210. They're essentially the same thing, except the 210 has upgraded, uh, uh, upgraded CPU inside of it. But for the most part, they're physically the same now. Uh, we did a great video with uh, Tim Cashel of uh, Evolve. Evolve Academy, uh, showcasing some of the features of the 210. Um, it's a fantastic piece. So let's take a look real quick. Let's step back, throttle back. Let's look at the EC30, which is our smaller, smaller, more portable, compact controller. It's a bring your own computer. There's no internal CPU. It connects via USB. There's two rows of mappable assigned buttons. Um, it's great for programming, you know, quicker programming and preset access. And it comes with that sweet, sweet high resolution T-bar. Small, compact, portable, fits into a carry-on size bag. It's fantastic. Uh, we have one in the studio here today. They're great. Uh, EC50 is a bring-your-own-computer. Bring There's no internal CPU for that one as well, but it does connect to the full integrated HD touchscreen uh, through USB and DVI, right? So the touchscreen is, is actually active inside of it. It's, it's a pretty, pretty awesome little product. That comes with three rows of mappable assign buttons for quicker programming and preset access. Also has that sweet high resolution T-bar. Now let's talk about the 210. It has a built-in dedicated CPU as opposed to the 30 and the 50, which do not. So that means you don't have to have an external computer hooked up to it. It is a standalone product. It has two full HD touch screens. It has X, Y, and size wheels. Uh, that allow you to move, move and scale your pips uh, natively. Right? We have the advanced programming section, also known as the right hand of the board. If you take a left, if you take a look at the left hand of the board, you'll notice it looks exactly like an EC50. If you take a look at the right, that's our advanced programming section, uh, also known as um, syntax, syntax control or syntax-based programming. If you talk to any of the operators that have taken the course or anybody that's been uh, trained formally on the uh, EC210, they'll tell you that uh, once you get used to it, it's actually lightning fast to use that syntax-based programming. Uh, high resolution, you know, has the same sweet high resolution T-bar that's in the 50 and the 30, uh, but this one does come with a built-in wheel mouse. So uh, you, it's pretty much a standalone package. It's, it's fantastic. We also support third-party control. So we have um, like the official Stream Deck plugin uh, that's available. We, we're, we're, we're good with Crestron. Where there's an app. You could find it right there through that link. Or you can use the Alfred Preset Remote, which is an iPad app, right? So we, we offer multiple control routes, not just through Event Master Toolset. And to take it a step further, we even open up the API so you can program your own control, uh, control protocol, like through JSON commands or you know, use external media servers to fire off um, telnet commands at the box, right? We, off, we, we accept telnet commands. So with all that said, we're nearing the end of our PowerPoint here. And, and what we want to show you is uh, that we offer in-person uh, certified training programs, right? And you can find those links if you had, to, or you can find this, this, the classes if you head to the links the link above there and you follow through with say Barco Certified Operator or Barco Certified Specialist where we really dive deeper. We dive much, much deeper in those classes. In fact, that 
30-minute PowerPoint that I just gave actually takes about uh, two hours of the class time to, to get through because um, there's so much more detail that we go into. We even offer expert classes, so if you want to take it to the next level, if you've passed your, your specialist class, you can come in and see us or come in and see one of your Barco, come into one of your Barco authorized training centers. We have them all over the country. We have them uh, in, in uh, Sacramento, California, also known as Rancho Cordova, uh, if you hit the list. We have them in uh, Texas. We have them in Denver. Um, in, I'm sorry, excuse me. We have them in Texas. We have them in Colorado. We have them in Florida. We have them in Nevada. Um, they're all over the United States, right? So come see us at one of those classes. Um, we'll be happy to have you. Okay, so I think we are going to uh, go to our setup, right? So we're going to create a setup today. And what I want to do is just give you a quick look at what the setup would look like um, while I change over to my Event Master tool set and prepare all of that, right? So that's ready to go. So here's the set. Here's the gag. We got a widescreen destination. We have a side screen. We have an auxiliary destination that we're going to set up. Now, uh, it's not specified here on the setup on our quick drawing, right, on our quick drawing. But what the widescreen is is essentially a, it's a large canvas of 3840 by 1080. It utilizes two 1920 by 1080 uh, outputs. And those are going to be overlapped 600 pixels to create a, an effective canvas of 3240 by 1080. Um, and we're going to use one of our MacBook Pros as the wide background for that, the native background. So we're going to set that to 3840 by 1080. We're going to use a couple of MacBook Pros as sources, uh, and then we're going to um, uh, we're going to set up a camera as well. We've got a little in-room camera over there set up. Um, so we're also going to set up the multi-view for that, which you'll which you'll see you know bounce up uh, periodically, uh, as well as as a, as a, that side screen. So. We're gonna, I'm going to walk you through that. And in order to, to do these setups, we do this, this, this awesome thing called uh, uh, BIOS. We have this acronym called, uh, we call it BIOS, uh, which stands for uh, Backgrounds, Inputs, Outputs, Screens, and Save. And actually, what we, you know, we say BIOS, but what we actually mean is Backgrounds, Save, Input, Save, Output, Save, Screens, Save. We want to save after every step, right? It's important to save after every step because if you do not save after every step and somehow you lose power at the venue or, or something, you know, maybe negative happens that you didn't want to have in, a, a, you, you'll lose all of your progress as you're going along, right? So um, essentially, we, we try to beat it into you to make the habit of saving after every step. So B, S, I, S, O, S, so on, so forth. Okay. So... Uh, one of the first things we want to do is switch over to Event Master Toolset. Let's take a look at that. Uh, here's you know, our first exposure to Event Master Toolset. So we're just going to give you a really, really, really quick tour of it, and then we're going to move right into BIOS. So on the left-hand side here, we have our six buttons. We have our configuration button, our programming button, uh, the Q button, the multi-viewer, the controller, and the settings. We're not really going to dive too deep into some of those buttons, but we may... Uh, dive into the to the configuration and programming button. We have our save button down here at the bottom left. Make sure click that a bunch of times, like I just did. We have our discovered tab where we'll have all the, our discovered units. Now, what you'll see here is two units. One is the demo E2 that I'm going to be performing the setup on. The other one is a stream E2, which um, my buddy Mike Pritchard in the room here is operating uh, and doing a fantastic job. So we'd like to thank him for uh, for for providing support today. So I'm going to take this demo E2. I'm going to drag it right into this drop zone that says drag and drop system into the from the discovered tab into or manually into the IP address. So maybe we didn't see them in the discovered tab. We could potentially just drag it or we could uh, type in the IP address and hit enter or hit add system and it would add the system to our, to our little deal here. So we have the detail view. We have the VPU resource. We have multi-operators, some things we're not going to talk about, but I just want to show you those tabs are there. We can rename the, the E2 if I want to. I could zoom out. I could zoom in. I can add an additional system. Say I wanted to take that other stream E2 and make some adjustments to it. Speaking of adjustments over here across the top, we have our adjust tab, or also known as the contextual adjust tab. That's, that tab actually changes context uh, of its contents based upon where you click. So if we click an output, it gives us a different context than if we click an input or if we click the banner, right? So it's, it's an ever-evolving tab. It's an ever-contextually adjustable tab or contextually adjusting tab. 
And we call it that. We call it the contextual adjust tab. And it's important that it's, and it's always anchored in the top right. So, so we really want to pay attention to that. All right, so uh, we have our destination tab, our output tab, our multi-viewer tab, our input tab, our background tab, so on and so forth. Well, uh, we have our background tab here. We want to create two backgrounds according to our setup. Uh, so we want to create a side screen setup, a side screen background, and a wide screen background, right? So uh, we need to create two of them. Now let's go ahead and create, I'm going to grab one of these dead inputs and hit add single background. So if we take a look at the background and go to the contextual adjust tab, we can rename it here. So we'll call it the side screen. Now by default, everything we create in Event Master is set to, 19, uh, set to single link and 1920 by 1080 at 5994 because that's kind of like the most common. Now you can adjust the system native rate down here at the bottom uh, or you can uh, you know, adjust the actual resolution of, uh, of the EDID um, to change over and we're going to do that on the next step but I'll show you and I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, so we, we've renamed this background to uh, side screen. So we'll go back into our background tab. We'll select a second spigot. I know this is my, my wide MacBook Pro, so I'm going to hit Add Single Background. Now, if I had s multiple backgrounds that I wanted to bring in at the same time, I could hit Add Multiple Backgrounds, but I don't. So I'm just going to select this one. I'm going to call this one Wide uh, Mac. Oh, you know what? Let me call it uh, uh, 3840 Background. Okay, 3840 background, we'll go to the contextual adjust tab. Now, by default, this is live hooked up to a, to a, pro, to a, a MacBook Pro. Uh, this it comes in as 1920 by 1080 because that's what the EDID is set to. But what I really want to do is set it to 3840 by 1080. But in order to do that, I actually have to adjust the capacity on it. So I'll select the capacity, the connector capacity, and select dual link. Now, I could have done that before I created the background, but... Um, it's possible to do it both before and after you create the background as long as you have the appropriate capacity on that card available. All right, so we've set it to dual link. Now let's go down. Let's pick out our dual link resolution. So we should see it down here, 3840 by 1080. And we'll hit apply. And you'll see the current went from 1920 by 1080 to 3840 by 1080. And we see uh, our actual um, input it went invalid for a second. Now, one of the things I have to do is I actually have to go over there real quick and um, uh, adjust the display resolution to adhere to that 3840 by 1080p uh, EDID that I sent to it. So I'm going to put you on hold for just one second while I walk over there and adjust it. Okay, so I'm back, and as you can see, uh, the format status went to 3840 by 1080 automatically, right? Because I went over and I adjusted the output, and we'll see that later on. I'll show you that in the multi-view after I build it. Um, okay, so we've created our two backgrounds, and you'll notice that there's th actually three different colors that are happening here. We have a yellow, we have a red, and we have a green. Those are indications of the status of the basically the input spigot, right? So yellow means there's a signal coming in, but there's nothing assigned to it. Red means that there is uh, no signal attached to it, even though the box think there's, thinks there's supposed to be one. And then green means that they know that there's a signal coming in, and they know that we're going to utilize that input later on, right? Okay, so uh, what's next? Well, we save, save after every step, right? But let's take a look at BIOS one more time. So we got backgrounds, uh, inputs, outputs, screens, and save. So uh, next we want to do our inputs, right? Well, we've got a couple of inputs here. We've actually got uh, four live inputs, and we're, you know, we're going to create a couple of others. So what we're going to do for this is we're going to select it and hit Add Single Input, or we can select Multiple and hit Add Multiple, and it'll create a file for each one of those. Now, by default, if we take a look at them, they're going to actually show what the inputs are coming in, right? Or again, by default, they'll come in as 1080p, right? Meaning, you know, you can set up your inputs before you have them connected because you know that somebody may be unloading the truck and they're going to set up the source later on, but you know you're going to plug it into a specific spigot so you can call out that specific spigot and set it up for it. Okay, so we've got our inputs set up. Um, I'm going to go back and change them, or change the names of them real quick. So we'll call this one um, GRFX1. 
uh, bu -bu 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 playback one. We'll call this one um, VT one. And miscellaneous input, and then a camera, right? So cam one. All right, so we have our input set up. They're all, you know, if we take a look at the adjust tab, they're all bringing in on their native resolutions. All right, so we take a look at our camera, 1080i, beautiful, perfect. All right, we're good to go over there. So then uh, let's take a look at our uh, next step, which is uh, outputs. But before we move on to outputs, we've got to save, right? So we'll save that, to save all those inputs, and we'll go on to our outputs. Now, if we take a look at our setup real quick, if we take a look at the slide for our setup real quick, then we'll see we have a widescreen, a side screen, and an aux destination, which is a total of four physical outputs, two for the widescreen, one for the side screen, and one for the aux destination. So if we go back to Event Master Toolset, we could set up our four outputs just like we set up our inputs. Um, one, of, one of the rules that we kind of like to, to throw at new users is to split them up, split up the destinations on different cards. So let's do maybe screen destinations on one card and aux destinations on another, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to add these three screen destinations by selecting them. And just like we did with the multiple inputs, we're going to select add multiple outputs. We'll select, uh, we'll grab the left one here, and we'll grab this one, and we know that's going to be my wide left. By the way, we're going to run a little bit over time. Sorry about that. Wide right. And then we're going to do our side screen. All right. And then we're going to select this one and hit an add single output. And we'll call this one our uh, DSM, OK, downstage monitor. All right. So we have our wide left, wide right, side screen, DSM. We know that they're all, def by default, they set, they're set up to be 1920 by 1080 there. So we're, we're pretty good there. So we have our outputs built. We're good to go. So I'm going to hit the Save button. And uh, we're going to move on. So um, we've created our backgrounds. We've created our inputs. We've created our outputs. Now it's time to create our uh, destinations. So uh, let's create our, our screen destinations after we save and save again by going to the Destination tab. We'll select a destination and hit Add Screen Destination. Now, by default, it goes to one output, right? Because we had selected that one output. It goes to one output, 1920 by, 1920 by 1080 at 5994 with zero layers associated with it. So let's just change the name real quick. We'll call this one the widescreen. And then let's add the second output to make it a true widescreen. So it's two outputs at 1920 by 1080, right? So it's two outputs at 3840 by 1080, excuse me, at 5994. And let's add some layers to that, right? So we'll select the destination. We'll scroll down, and we'll add three layers to that, OK? So. Uh, after we've added the three layers, we can start our data double process, where we'll go into the wide. I'm not going to go into too much explanation on this, um, but we're going we're to use this little explodey button right here on the right. We're going to select the portion, and we're going to go into data double. We're going to select the portion in which we'd like to data double and establish our data double value, which is 600, right? 3840 by 1080, uh, less the 600 is 3240 by 1080, like we talked about earlier. And we're going to offset that so they're center justified on that canvas. Okay, so here we are offsetting it. And so we'll, we'll just assign the offset value to 300, which is going to center that, uh, that data double into our canvas space. So this black area is our canvas space with our outputs observing it, right? Now, we can go into the feathering. We could actually do the feathering here in the E2, or you could do it at the projector. And there's a whole argument that we could get into about which one's better. Uh, but it breaks down, you know, the, the ultimate argument breaks down to whether it's, um, you know, the, the transmission method of the cable you're using versus what's available in the projector. So we're just going to show you how to do it here in the Event Master Toolset if you choose Event Master Toolset, which is fantastic feathering. It's a 12-bit internal feather. Uh, so it's awesome. So you'll select the left side of the right and the right side of the left. Those are your two feather, feather regions. So they, they go from 0 to 100 and 0 to, or 100 to 0. We'll enable the feather and then we'll add a 600 pixel feather. So there we have it. We're actually kind of done with this. We'll close down the splody view. We have our side widescreen destination, two outputs, three layers. It's, it's data doubled. It's good to go. So we'll select our side screen. We'll go back to the destination tab. We'll hit add screen destination. We'll call this one side screen. 
We'll go into the contextual adjust tab. Let's add a couple of layers to it right off the bat. We know it's a 1920 by 1080 because that's what the output was set, was set to, so we're actually good there. We can move on. All right, and then the aux will go to the destination tab and we'll select the physical aux here and we'll hit add aux destination. You'll see it differenti differentiates itself. Uh, so we'll go to the aux destination and we'll rename it uh, DSM to match the physical output that we renamed. And I'm not going to get too far into it, but we're going to set the aux capacity uh, to accept dual link resolutions. So we could take in the background and scale it to the, to the aux capacity, the aux output, or we could take the destination composition and scale it down and send it out of the aux output if we set it to dual link because of the, it needs to be able to receive dual link and those two items are dual link, de, uh, dual link capacity. So that's it for, um, for the setup and configuration. I'm actually going to observe the break uh, at 9.50 and when we come back we're going to set up the multi-view real quick. Uh, we'll set up the multi-view, we'll go through the programming page and, and show you how to build some presets, some user keys and whatnot. Um, it'll be great. All right, so uh, join us back here at 10.05 uh, after the break. Well, again, we'll, we'll, we'll get started. All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. So... Uh, during the break, you know, it occurred to me that, uh, you know, this is just a basics class. We, we want to really break that down. This is just, uh, not even a class, it's just base, basic exposure. In fact, uh, you know, one of the other things that we would like to, to add is that the video of, um, the video of this setup has actually been out for quite a few years. And it's been sitting in the Barco Folsom IP page uh, as how to set up an S3 Junior or basic setup of an S3 Junior Part 1 and Part 2. And again, you know, we talked about um, the difference in the difference between the processors. Well, an S3 Junior is a, essentially the same workflow as an E2 or an S3, uh, just with, you know, decreased capacity. So if you miss anything today, if you need to come back to it, you can either come back to this video or you can go into a little bit more detail uh, on the how to set up an S3 or basic setup of an S3 Junior that's found here on the Barco Folsom IP page as well as uh, we want you to come and visit us at one of our classes. So when we left off before we went to break, we had just finished programming our setup, right? Well, now we want to program our multi-view before we move on to our actual programming of our compositions. So over the next 45 minutes or so, we're gonna cover the multi-view, we're gonna cover programming, uh, to give you a nice good tour of the programming screen and then show you how to build presets, show you how to build presets, um, utilize user keys, utilize uh, maybe, maybe even show off moves or something like that. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how, it, how much time we have. So uh, we're going to go into the multi-view tab over here, the multi-view button. So as I click on this multi-view button, um, we should see the programming interface for our multi-viewer. All right, so over here on the left, we have the input tab where we see all of our inputs that are coming in. We have our background tab where we see all of our backgrounds coming in. We have the destination tab uh, where we see all of our destinations, both the program canvas and the physical outputs. We're not gonna talk about that though. Across the top here, we have our multi-viewers. We have multi-view one, multi-view two, three, and four. Because we are using a generation two card, it, gives us four discrete multi-viewers. Remember, we talked about that. So here they are represented um, as, a, as a little canvases, right? So we have our four discrete multi-viewers. We can view all or we can kind of zoom in and, and look at one specifically or two specifically or so on and so forth. We can zoom out and see the canvas there. We can zoom in to get a little bit more detailed view, uh, but we'll sit it down right at 100. And because we're only going to be using one multi-view today, we're just going to switch over to multi-view one and kind of pay attention to that one. So it's super simple to start building your multi-view. You go to your input tab. You drag and drop your input. You can expand it, make it smaller, take some more inputs in, right? We can go and drag all of our inputs in. Okay, our miscellaneous, that was a dead one, remember that? And then we have our camera, okay? So we have our camera set up here. We can set these aside, you know, we can, we can start building a cohesive look or 
uh, we can go into our auto layout input and automatically take all of our inputs and lay them out right in a nice clean view. We also have tools down below to help us uh, if, say if something gets knocked off kilter and we want to want to readjust it and, and make it look all nice and pretty we can do that I'll get to those in just a sec so let's take a look at our background here let's take a look at our ba wide background graphic uh, we can we can size it and if we go to the contextual adjust tab here we can actually size it here manually we can change the horizontal position as well as the vertical position or if you're new to event master or I'm sorry if you're an experienced user in event master uh, we used to have custom sizes or um, pre-can sizes, but now we have these custom sizes that you can build and create and, and edit. So let's say I wanted to make uh, every input this size, so I would select it and I would select a custom size and I would hit override size. Maybe I could rename it if I wanted to this size. And then I can take it and apply it to other uh, is by selecting it, selecting the window, and hit apply custom size, and you'll notice that they're now the same size, right? So I can, I can, you know, uh, replicate the sizes across instead of having the pre-canned customs like the maybe the uh, ori you know original users are used to seeing. Um, the window size we're not going to really talk about. That's actually a, a future, uh, future uh, feature that's coming. So UMD text, we can change the UMD text, say on graphics one to this UMD. UMD stands for under monitor display, so that would be this little UMD text right here. Or we can reset the UMD. Now if we do change the UMD text, it doesn't actually change the text of the input, it just changes the text of the input, of the, uh, excuse me, changes the text of the UMD. So for this guy right here, for this cam, we could change it to like Jeff's cam, right? Or we can reset it back to cam, cam one, cam whatever. So we take a look at the output colors tab. The output colors tab is great, so we specify multi-viewer number one. We can change the color of the borders. We can change the color of uh, the UMD itself, right? So if we, if we take a look at uh, the multi-viewer, the demo multi-viewer output, right, um, we can see these, these changes happening on the multi-viewer in real time. Right, so... Uh, here we have, we could change the background, so we go to the background and I can change the background to like a nice barco red to match my, um, or we can go to blue or green or white or black, right? We can get, you know, we can start to customize our interface essentially. And so we see our uh, actual multi-view. Uh, I'm actually going to start over again real quick. I'm going to hit the auto layout input and we'll watch it, watch it just re, you know, reset it. And we could drag in our backgrounds. So let's, uh, or let's, our background's already there, excuse me. We can drag in our destinations. So let's start dragging in our destinations. And let's, you know, make those a little bit larger or maybe a little bit smaller. And you'll see that the, the preview and program are kind of tied together because those are the screen destinations, the screen canvases. So we'll take the side screen and we'll make that one a little bit larger. We'll take the preview for that side screen. And we'll take the DSM. Now, uh, you know, by default, sometimes I get a little lazy and I just drag them in and I go, oh, you know what, I, I want to make this prettier. I can either eyeball it out, right, and hope that the snap works, which we don't actually have a snap built in. It just kind of automatically um, drags into those, uh, to those areas, okay. Uh, or I could go down below and use our window modification buttons. And those window modification buttons are, are very helpful. So we could do, say, multiple select and we can select these two or uh, say these four, and we can move them up and down, right, and move them all around, okay? Now, uh, let's say, you know, uh, well, I wanted to align them all back to where they were up top. Well, I would select all of these and use our align relative buttons so I can write align relative top, or I can align distribute horizontally, which will then distribute them all evenly horizontally. So I can do that same to uh, select the multi-viewer, unselect all. I can do the same to these two here, and then align relative. Or I can use align absolute, which sends them to the edge of the screen. Okay, so I can align relative. Um, I can select these two, and then deselect these two, align relative, take them, drag them over, and then do, say, these two, and align relative top, take 
do you select these two, select these two, and align relative bottom. And there we have, you know, all four of these windows nice and clean. We can drag that one in. We'll unselect all of them, take this guy right here. So we have a little bit of a cleaner multi-view. Now, you might say, well, hold up. I want to make this side screen a little bit bigger, you know, so I, I want to drag and, you know, just make it a little bit larger. Well, as we do that, we'll notice this little error at the bottom that says overlapping windows not allowed because we're trying to overlap onto that DSM window, right? So there are no overlaps allowed in your multi-view. Okay, so we'll turn multi-select off. So as we move that DSM, you'll notice that we're able to get a little bit bigger and release. Now you can overlap the, the UMD text. So you, you know, it's possible to overlap a little bit of the window, that also known as the UMD text. Uh, but it's, once you try to encroach upon that original windows, um, a little window, it stops you, okay? The other side to this is if you hang off the canvas, you'll notice it goes crosshatch. <clears throat> That's because it's, we're, we don't allow you to have a, a canvas window or an input window hanging off of the, uh, off of the programming screen, right? Off of the multi-view screen. You've got to be careful there. You can turn on the border. You can turn off the border. Uh, so if we take a look at um, select all border off inside of the multi-viewer there, right? Inside of the multi-viewer there. <laughs> um, you can see the border turning on, turning off. You can do the, yes, yes it is, multi-viewer is on, it's great. You can turn off the UMD text, you can turn on the UMD text, you can turn off the AOI markers, also known as area of interest markers, if you want to learn what those actually are, tune into our, our uh, future classes where we're going to talk about um, IP for LED. You could do the auto layout input, which we already talked about, you could do the auto layout destination, which you can imagine will uh, destroy everything and, and uh, and allow us to, um, or automatically add all the, the destinations first before it adds the inputs. All right, so that's multi-view in a nutshell. As you can see, it's a pretty powerful tool. We'll reference back to it later on when we, um, as we create these, uh, these outputs, right, as, we're, as we start to work on in these programming screens. So let's make this one a little bit bigger before we move on uh, so we can see that when we come back. And I want to turn on my, uh, I want to turn on my, AOI markers, okay, on all of them, AOI markers. Okay, so um, let's take a look at the programming section. We're going to take a look at the programming section. Now, the programming section is where all the magic happens, right? It's where you create all of your image compositions to be utilized um, in your show or in your setup or in your... Uh, facility or wherever you're using this event master processor, right? Because it's not just driven towards live events, it's also driven towards permanent installs type stuff. So this is, like I said, this is where you create your composition. So I'm going to give you a nice tour of this um, and then go through some individual features and create these presets that allow us to, to recall later to, uh, you know, on maybe on our controller or through an external software or whatever, uh, whatever you may be using. So across the left-hand side, we have the input tab and we have the native background tab. The input tab, if you drag a source from here or you drag an input from here, it goes to the scalers. If you drag an input source or, or input from the native background, it, uh, it will actually uh, go to the native background. Okay, so um, it will then uh, not use any of the scalers. It'll go to that native side. So we could use still stores, we could use live inputs, or... Uh, we could go in and use mats. It's not found in the tab. The mats are found somewhere else. I'll show you. Maybe I'll show you later. Okay, so let's go to the input tab because this is where we're going to drag all of our sources from for the scalers. And we will talk about the different types of inputs that you can use. You can use actual inputs, which utilize sources. You can use stills. You can use backgrounds as sources. You can use multi, the multi-view as a source in later, maybe in a new... new uh, new software that's coming out, like 7.1 or so. Uh, or you can use destinations as sources as well. So you could even do a sub-switching of a PIP, right? Uh, where you create a, a side screen destination, you switch inside of that PIP, but you use that side screen as a window inside of your widescreen. Maybe I'll show you how to do that if we have time. Uh, we can go into list view or thumbnail view. Thumbnail view gives us a sweet thumbnail view where we can add thumbnails. I have them already on my computer, so I'm going to add a few. 
In fact, I'm going to ask, uh, ask for your, your forgiveness here while I just go through and add a couple so we can make this look a little bit more seamless. So I'm going to add graphics. Let's go with a playback. Uh, let's go with a VT1. VTA, how about that? And we'll do a miscellaneous or a misc. Call that demo one. And then we'll look at the cam. Now these are not uh, constantly updating thumbnails, so you gotta be careful there, don't trick yourself. Uh, but what you can do is you can add a still from the input. So if we select this refresh thumbnail, uh, what it'll do is it'll grab a still from the input and assign it to the still. Uh, inside of that input, you can freeze it. There's three levels of freeze. You have freeze at the input, you have freeze at the layer, you have freeze at the output, okay? Or the destination, I should say, the destination level. Uh, we could take a still from there, or we can add a source, add a new source. We're not gonna talk about the source stuff really at all in this introductory course. Um, but if you want to come see us, take one of the classes, I'd be happy to show you uh, input, inputs, versus, inputs versus sources. Or you can check out um, Evolve did a, did a fantastic uh, explanation of inputs versus sources a couple of weeks back. Um, they, did a, they did a great job explaining that. You could take in stills, so I can add a new still from PNG locally. Or this is where I would see the list of stills that I captured from uh, from my, like let's say my camera, right? So I'll go back into my stills and I took a still from my camera. Here it is, 1920 by 1080. It is a progressive frame, even though it was interlaced. It just takes a photo of whatever, whatever, it basically takes a photo of whatever the input was coming into the input at the time. All right, so here it is, there's my still. I could use my backgrounds as sources like we talked about earlier where I could scale them up or down, but we're not gonna get into that. Or I could use my destination. So here we have our inputs. Okay, we have, our, we have basically all of our inputs coming into the box. We have our programming section. So we have program up at the top, preview at the bottom. Uh, if we take a look at each one of these, we could zoom out. We could zoom in. Right? We can enable or disable them for transition. So that's how we specify which one we want to enable or disable. Uh, we have the lock to stop us from, alt from uh, altering it while it's alive on program, because this would be your program section, this would be your preview. So uh, we have the, you know, down below we have the freeze destination outputs. Again, that's with a layer of freeze. We can lock or unlock all of our destinations. We can select or deselect all of our destinations for transition or record into a preset. We can turn on our AOI or area of interest markers or turn them off. We can do multiple layouts. So. Um, up above here, we have our options on which destination we want to really dive deep into, right? So if I select one of these and like say the widescreen, I can uh, just focus on the widescreen or if I just want to focus on the side screen or the DSM. But you got to remember when you focus in on these, just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. So if the widescreen is armed or the widescreen is enabled for a transition and I go over to the side screen, that widescreen is still enabled for transition over on the other view. It's just not viewable, right? It's just not visible. So we can also shift these around and make these a little, you know, make these a little bit easier to, dig to digest uh, when we hit the view all button, right? So, you know, let's say we want to make a specific layout where we only see the widescreen and the side screen as opposed to seeing either one or all. We can take and drag and drop the widescreen and the side screen into one of these layouts and select it. And here is our wide screen, wide screen in our side screen. Okay, so we'll go to view all, right? We see all three of them or we go to layout. Or maybe we wanna do a layout where we see our DSM and our side screen. So I'll select layout number two. And here's our side screen and DSM. I can even change the name of these layouts if I want to, right, to, to differentiate the two. Okay, so I can change the names of those layouts. This layout's a pretty, pretty awesome little tool. Um, I'll probably recall the layout number one later on. Over across the right-hand side, we have our adjustment tab, that sneaky little adjustment tab. Now it doesn't have anything to adjust, so it's kind of laying dormant. Uh, we have our layers tab, where we could see all of our layers for our different destinations, and whether they're on preview or they're on program or whatnot. So let's take a look at the widescreen. They're both not being utilized right now, so they're yellow. If they were on preview, uh, then they would be 
uh, green. If they were on program, they would be red. Actually, let's take a look at that. So let's take a look at uh, layer one. Let's drop it into, um, oops, sorry, wide screen, side screen. Okay, I want to go into side screen. Let's take a look at layer one, go to the side screen. And here we have our layer, right? So here we have our layer. It's in preview right now, so we won't see it on program. Uh, it's a single link. It's layer number one. It does not have a source associated to it, and it is a pip with a mix, right? So it gives us some information of it, right? It gives us some information. Uh, so how do we get the source into that layer? How do we get an input into that layer? Well, you simply drag and drop the input in, right? And there it is. Let's use the camera. How about that? We'll use the camera there, okay? So we have our camera here. There's our sanitation wipes for social distancing and cleaning all of the equipment as we've been using it, right? Uh, before it changes hands in the of, a, of our uh, operators here in room. So uh, we have a uh, camera that we want to send to program. Well, how do we do it? We make sure that the uh, side screen here is enabled, and we just hit the all transition, right? Or the side screen is enabled for transition, and we hit the all transition button. And so you'll see it on our multi-view. If we switch over to our multi-view, you'll see it in our preview and our program. All right? So there's our preview, there's our program. And here it is live on program. So if we move it here, there's our program. So we'll just we'll just take a look at the, the, the multi-view exclusively. Or, you know. uh, so here is our side screen with our uh, preview and program. Now I want to lock that back up and I don't want to touch it or move it or do anything like that. So um, Essentially, what we're going to do is, is make adjustments in our preview and then hit all trans. So we'll take like playback one or graphics one and we'll transition it to program, right? Make a move or a, move it over, resize it, maybe make it full screen, transition it to program, and you'll see it happening there in our multi view, right? Okay, so. Uh, let's switch it over to camera and then hit all trans. It's, very, it's really that simple. You take an input, you drag it into a layer, uh, and then you're on your, on your way. Now, you might say, well, hold on now. What if I want to make, what if I want to add another layer? Or what if I don't want to grab a layer from the layer tab and then add an input to it? Well, you could simply drag an input in, and it will grab the first available layer. It will grab the first available layer and transition that and, and allow it to transition to screen, right? So you'll see that layer two here is superseding layer one or on top of layer one, or our Z order goes layer one is the furthest away from you, right? So layer one being the furthest away from you, and then layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five, layer six, layer seven, so on and so forth, okay? So layer two is gonna sit over the top of layer one, we can actually um, adjust the Z order if we want to, uh, but we'll get to that in just a second. Okay, across the right-hand side, we have the destination group, which we're not going to really go into. Uh, we have the user key tab. The user key tab is great. The user, so user keys um, essentially allow us to record uh, what we call, um, or what some people call treatments of a window or of a layer, right? So it's attributes that uh, we can pre-select and record to be recalled later to uh, one or many layers. So let's take a look at uh, VTA here. And we'll go with, um, uh, you know, I really like the size and position of that. And right? I really like the size and position of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my user key tab. I'm going to deselect everything except for position and size. And I'm going to save it as a new user key. And I'll call this one uh, top left medium. Eh, we'll call that small. Okay. So we got our small there. And... Uh, uh, what we'll do is we'll actually um, uh, bring in another layer, like our camera, and you say, you know what, maybe I'll move that one out of the way, and I want to go ahead and take my uh, take those attributes that I had saved into top left small and apply them to that camera. I'll simply drag and drop, and it snaps in there. And I can do that with any layer that I bring into that destination. Okay, so it's pretty cool. You know, you can um, you can save attributes, position, size, source. What its mask, the status of its mask, the border, shadow, the key, everything, right? So you might ask, but Vince, 
how do I adjust those things? Like, how do I add a border? How do I add a shadow? How do I adjust the mask? Well, it's as simple as going into the select, sorry, selecting the layer and going into the contextual adjust tab. And here's where you'll see all of the awesome adjustments that you can make to your layers. So we have the layer type, whether it's a pip or a key, right? We have the uh, add key frame where, where we'll talk about moves. Maybe we'll go over moves if we have time. Uh, we can go into the uh, layer main where we can add our border or our shadow. So we could turn on the border. We could turn on the shadow, right? Maybe we want to do a shadow and we want to do it uh, blue shadow instead. Right? So you'll see inside of our multi viewer, inside of our multi viewer, you can see the blue border, the, the, the gray border with the blue shadow on it, right? Or a white shadow, maybe you want to do a white shadow to it. And we can make all the adjustments to those, or we can turn them off because if a border and shadow isn't done correctly, it doesn't look great. Right? We all know that. We've all seen that. So um, let's ditch the border shadow. Maybe we want to go in and do a mask. Well, we'd go into the window adjustment. Inside the window adjustment, we can adjust the size, right? We can adjust the, the size of the window. Whoa, oh, there we go. We can adjust the size of the window. We can adjust the position of the window. Now these are very, very touchy controls, which is why we give you the plus and minus or the ability to type in or the ability to even reset, right? You can reset it back to zero, zero, the center, okay? With at, a, at a specified size, pre-specified size. Or here's where you can adjust your mask. Right, so we can start masking off our layers. Now this happens at the layer level. It doesn't happen at the source level. It doesn't happen at the input level. It doesn't happen at the output level. These adjustments, when the contextual adjust tab is focused in on the layer, will happen at the layer level. Okay, so let's reset everything. Uh, reset everything, everything, and, uh, and move on. Okay, so we can make those adjustments and then we can go into our user key tab and select the adjustments that we want to observe and apply to something else to apply to another layer and save those, right? So it's very, uh, it's quite an awesome little, um, uh, quite an awesome little feature. All right, uh, user keys, super useful when you start talking about controllers. Maybe if we have time, we'll, we'll work on, uh, we have about 20 minutes left, 20, 30 minutes left. We'll talk about, maybe we talk about programming a controller or something like that. Um, so those user keys are super awesome for programming. They make life so much easier, especially if you're working in the LED workflow and you, know, you have specified screen sizes for your LED that you didn't carve out inside of your AOI or you want to always automatically drop something. You, know. um, you can even bind those user keys to sources, uh, which we're not going to talk about. Just let that kind of flow over you. If you don't understand it, come see us at one of our classes. We'll show you how to bind a user key to a source. Okay, so I'll deselect everything and we'll move on. All right, let's go to the preset tab. So if we take a look at the preset tab and we go to the view all, right? Um, the preset tab, uh, essentially, if it's set to a, com I'm sorry, the preset tab, if it's set to complete, essentially what it does is it takes a snapshot of all of the destinations, their status, and if they're highlighted for transition or selected for transition, it will actually take a snapshot of that destination and all of the layers that are inside of that destination. So let me show you a quick, uh, quick example of that. Let's go ahead and let's um, use, uh, let's drag in VTA over here. We'll make a quick, quick, uh, quick look here. Maybe not the, the uh, best of all um, looks. Let's go with VTA, all right. Um, We'll just kind of build it out real quick on the rough cut. You know, we can go back into the contextual adjust tab and get more fine, finite and uh, more accurate settings or uh, positions for these layers if we really wanted to, but we don't. We're just doing a little rough in. And then let's do a camera on the side with, uh, with a little VT in the bottom right-hand corner or maybe a little graphics in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, and then we'll, we'll do a graphics in the downstage monitor. So now every one of these destinations is selected. Ooh, uh, you know what? Let's go ahead and add the live background too, right? It's because we have the native background. Let's add that, go to the native background tab and drop in that background and we'll see that native background right here in our, in our multi-view, right? See there in our multi-view. 
Great. So we see it in our multi-view. Uh, so if we take a look at uh, those, those, you know, we, we can recall that later, right, by creating a preset. So let's go to the preset tab and let's save from preview because we want to save from the preview section. Or we could save from program even though there's nothing on program. So let's save from preview. I don't want to say nothing, but there's not really much going on on program. And let's just call this look number one. Now let's say we wanted to transition to a different look quickly. How do we do that? Well, we create a second look or a second preset to, uh, uh, to transition to. So let's clear out. Let's actually, maybe let's go back to the inputs and let's make these sides, make, maybe make them cameras. And let's make the native background by selecting the background here, the background tab here and going to the contextual adjust tab. Let's make the background a matte red. Okay, so we have a matte red there. And then we'll do, um, we'll go and select the camera. We'll clear that out. We'll use graphics two, full screen, and then we'll select um, playback one for the downstage monitor, right? So for this one, if we select it, we go to the preset tab and we hit save from preview, it will basically record everything that's in our preview. So we'll save from preview and we'll call this one look two. So if we're in our preset tab, we have a couple of options. We're only going to show you complete, not relative today, there, although there is a video on relative presets that uh, Tim and I did with Evolve Media. Uh, and and uh, you can go check that out. It's also on the Bar Barco Folsom IP. Uh, we can override it if we selected it. We can override it from preview. We can override it from program. We can delete it. We can enable a reorder. We can lock them all. We can unlock them all. If we lock them all, it obviously stops us from overwriting them or changing the name of them. Uh, we can unlock them all to where we change the name, or we could change the number as well. And then we have creation options. I'm not going to really go into that. Uh, so we could select it, say select a preset, and hit recall current. And you'll see that it recalls that preset that we had made earlier, right? So it recalls that preset that we made earlier. Or we can hit recall look two. Now these are ready for transition because they sit in our preview. So watch me, watch what happens when I transition them from preview to program, right? Inside of our multi-view there, you can see it transition from preview to program. So we'll recall, hit all trans, recall, hit all trans, and you can see them transitioning, right? Seem, nice seamless dissolve from transition from A to B, all right? So you might say, okay, well that's a three-step process. That's all well, fine and dandy, but what happens if I wanna do it just a little bit quicker? Well, uh, one of the things we could do is change the, way we, change the way we recall the preset. Like, I can change the preset by selecting, by selecting one, dragging and dropping it in, and releasing, right? And, and that'll, that'll automatically uh, change the preset. Or I could select the thumbnail view and just recall them quickly by selecting the thumbnail. So there we have a very quick switch between presets, right? And we can even take that one step further and we can say instead of, it instead of recalling the preset to preview, we re recall the preset to program. See how everything turns red? So if we select the preset, it'll recall the program, right? So we have our, our preset to program. And then we have our, uh, finally we have our queue page, but we're not going to really talk about the queue page, so we're, we're, we're going to skip over that. Um, let's go back, I'll tell you what, let's reset back to preview and let's go back to list view um, and where we can then, uh, where we can then, you know, re, re, no, rename, reorder, uh, reorder, do the whole deal, okay? So across the bottom, we've got some creature features for our operators, right? Like um, we have the multiple select on, multiple select off, so we can multiple select layers, right? And move them around. We can unselect, we could select all and unselect all so maybe if we want to do a clear all, we could select all and hit clear, and it would clear all of our uh, destinations, our layers, and our backgrounds, the whole deal, right? It clears everything where we transition, and now we're at black. Okay. Um, we could do a match program. So let's say we transition to screen, and I wanted to uh, take these two pips here, and I hit match program. You'll see that they match the actual program. We can unselect all. Uh, let's turn off our multiple select, but let's select one. We could do a toggle or swap, not going to get into what that does or how that works. Um, we could do a freeze. We could do a clear, right? So I could select it, I could hit clear, or I could select it and I could hit freeze. Again, that's one of the three places you can freeze. Again, at the input, the layer level, and the, um, 
uh, the layer level and at the destination level. I can do a transition if, if I'm not frozen, right? I can unfreeze it. If I can do a transition of just one layer, even though all of my screen destinations are selected and ready for transition, I can do a, a, a transition of just one layer if I wanted to. Oh, excuse me. Let's go with the miscellaneous, right? So a little black, just solid black input. Uh, if I hit the, if I select it and hold it and hit all trans, you'll notice that only that layer made a transition. Only, only that layer made a transition, right? So I have a layer transition as opposed to an all transition. So I can start to specify which layers I want to transition. I have a uh, fill, hor fill vertical, a fill horizontal. You'll notice that if we fill the vertical, it maintains aspect ratio filling it vertically. If we fill horizontal, it, uh, it maintains the aspect, uh, aspect ratio and fills horizontally. And we have a fill HV, which will destroy aspect ratio. So if we took in, say, camera one, you'll notice it specifically in camera one. If we go fill HV, it destroys the aspect ratio, but it does fill it horizontally and vertically. So technically, it's, it works. So if we were in, say, graphics one here, or if we were in side screen here and we did fill HV, because it is the same aspect ratio, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't alter the aspect ratio of it. It doesn't destroy the aspect ratio because it's filling horizontally, filling vertical 16 by 9 on a 16 by 9. Don't fear, though, if, in, if, you, if you do fill HV, you can always fill vertical, fill horizontal to restore the aspect ratio, or you can hit the reset button, and the reset button will reset the aspect ratio and allow you to, uh, you know, scale it up and down, move it around, okay? More creature features here on the left-hand side. We have a line absolute left, a line absolute right. We have the same features. Let's take a look at the widescreen here specifically. We have the same features that we saw earlier inside of our multi-view tab where uh, we can take and we can do a multiple select on, select multiples, and then do a line relative top. We can do, uh, say, a line relative bottom. We can do a line absolute bottom. We can do align absolute top. We can even do align absolute right or left. And what that's going to do is that will align them absolute right or left. Right? So let's multiple select on again and then do align. But because we can overlap, you can see how easy it is to overlap them. Right? And we can overlap with these pips to create these compositions. So you can see how easy it is to lose those pips uh, behind each other. In fact, if you're paying attention, I recorded a preset earlier where I had a a layer full screen on top of another layer. That's kind of a faux pas. It's a little bit, a little bit of a bush league maneuver, but you know, um, it's possible to layer pips, and that's the point of it too, right? And 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 you know, I, it might have been a might have been a small mistake on my part, but I want to show you that it's still possible to do because we we don't allow just why you know one screen switching in, switching out. We allow that composition, and we allow you the ability to do that composition. That's important too because later on, if you do pips with keys on them or uh, you know, you want to do layering and, and, and window pipping, right? So you, maybe you have a backdrop where you show brick windows, and inside of those windows you want to put live inputs into those windows. So you can, you can utilize the masking to mask off to those windows and assign them and layer them over the top of others, right, to create um, ultimate, these, these looks ultimately, right? And that is the beauty of Event Master Toolset. That's the beauty of the E2 S3 uh, Image Pro line is that we allow you to do all of this stuff in ultra low latency, you know, high definition and UHD. We hit all the buzzwords, right? We hit the 444 internal processing. We hit the 12-bit internal processing. It's up to the to the user to get uh, 8 and 10, 12-bit in and out of it, right? Um, so we do all this, again, at ultra low latency, about a frame to a frame and a half, depending on the route you take to, it actually could be subframe, depending on the route you take through our, our, our box, right, as opposed to a media server, you know, where a media server has to process everything and could add um, extra frames to, to the output that are unnecessary, right? So um, I think we have a few more minutes. Uh, I'm going to show you how to program the controller real quick uh, using our, uh, our little our event master tool set. So uh, I've created a couple of presets. I have at least one user key. Let's create a second one so we can we can see some um, we can see a, you know some changes here, uh, some changes happening here. So let's focus in on the widescreen. Let's take 
Um, and maybe on the widescreen, I really like the way that this pip sits. So I'll do position, unselect everything. Oops, excuse me. Unselect everything and then select position and size. And I'll save this one as a new user key. I'll call this one uh, left. left maybe I'll clear this out I'll go in and I'll call this one right all right so um, I've got a couple of user keys that I can assign I've got a couple of presets I've got my destination set up good 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 all right so if I go into the controller uh, I have the option because I'm in a virtual or because I don't have a physical controller hooked up to my uh, computer. I have the option to either choose a, the programming for an EC30 or an EC50. Maybe I know an EC50 is coming later, uh, so I'm going to pre-program for that. So once I plug it in, it automatically just takes these settings and drops them right onto my EC50, right? So uh, it's actually really simple. You can go to your uh, destinations, select your widescreen, drag it in. There's your destination button. There's your side screen button. Uh, we have our auxiliaries like our DSM. I can drag it there. I can even you know, drop it into multiple positions. I can arm or disarm those, or not arm or disarm, excuse me, I can select for transition or, or deselect for transition those. So right now they're all deselected, see that? So if I go into my programming tab, they're all deselected. If I hit view all, they're all deselected. If I go back into my controller here, I can select them all, and we'll see in our programming that they're all selected for transition now. It's the same, you know, uh, same thought process as maybe hitting the all unlock, um, select all, deselect all, and you'll see that reflect in your controller. So when I, I can, my layers, these are hard buttons, these are, you know, dedicated towards uh, physical layers that are on that destination. So if I deselect my other destinations and I say select layer one, if we go back into our programming tab, um, we'll see in my, in my preview here, my layer one is, is selected for, for uh, manipulation. I can go in and I can drop in maybe cues, sources, user keys. Uh, we have a flex bus coming soon. Uh, preview source, program source, so you can use the controller as a preview program uh, switch now uh, or coming out soon. Um, that's pretty cool. User keys, I could drop in my user keys, so let's do that. So let's select uh, user key and we'll go left by just dragging and dropping it and then right. So let's go back and take a look at our programming. Right, well, let's move our user keys out, or let's move our layers out. Uh, select this one, clear this one out. We'll take layer one, and we'll go back into our controller. If we select the user key on the programmer, I mean on the, uh, on the controller, we select the left user key, we'll notice that it went to the left side. If we uh, go back to our controller, we hit the right user key, you'll notice it shifted over to our right side. In fact, um, let's, uh, let's see, bring up the multi-view real quick. So if I select it, to go to left, you could see it in the multi-view going to the left. Uh, if I select to, to go to the right, you could see it in the multi-view going to the right. Um, so you could see how you could utilize those user keys very quickly, right, to program. So you select a destination, you select the layer, you select the user key, and it'll perform the action that you want to make. Well, let's say you don't want such granularity. Let's say you wanted to go a little bit more broad, right? Well, we can take and go to the user key uh, sorry, uh, take the assign bus and go to the preset button. We'll program our presets by selecting a preset and dragging it into the to the uh, programming area, right? We'll drag it onto the little button. And if, say, we say uh, grab look one, so it'll select look one and recall it. We go look two, uh, select look two and recall it. There's look one again, here's look two. So you have, you know, a control surface that allows you to recall these presets uh, super quickly. Right? Now, there's two sides to... Uh, console basically you have your programming side you have your preset recall side and there's two different ways to set those up we go through those ways to set those up inside of our classes uh, once we resume them so please uh, feel free to stop by and uh, and see us and and, and we'll get you uh, we'll get you all dialed in on the controller you know we do the EC30 EC50 in the classroom um, we talk about Inputs versus sources, we talk about all the granular details of Event Master Toolset. We show you how to do keying. We show you how to do uh, uh, moves. We show you how to do moves. We're, we're, we're kind of crunched for time here, so we're going uh, to omit the move um, deal. And that's pretty much it for 
uh, event master tool set, exposure to event master tool set. Um, I think if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and please be sure to visit our website for the classes. And, and uh, again, we want to thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, just reach out. Yeah, I think that's about it.